Well, first of all, I don't play many instruments to a high standard. I just pluck and bang and scrape anything I can lay my hands on. <laughs> yeah. Um, how does that work? So a lot of my work, uh, yes, I mean, I, I work from home like many. I have a... I have a shed in the bottom of my, of my garden, and it's great to have that psychological barrier between home, uh, between work and and composing and and a home life. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, how does it work? So I, um, for the uh, like most composers, I work from home, and uh, it's it's a just a. Uh, I love collaborating with directors. You know, it's it's a very um, it's a collaborative art form, and like this project, uh, this particular film, compared to many others, it's um, I, I get brought in very very early on a project. So I worked on this film for fifteen months, uh, which is very unusual uh, uh, compared to other projects where I'll come in at the last minute to save a film, you know, and I have three weeks to score 50 minutes of music. Um, whereas this film, I had 15 months to write 50 minutes of music. So it's, it, it varies a lot. C'est à moi. Et du coup, elle a commencé par dire qu'elle ne joue pas parfaitement beaucoup d'instruments, même si c'est ce qui est annoncé, mais elle essaie. Elle travaille au domicile, dans son petit studio, dans son jardin, pour séparer son monde de travail et la maison, bien sûr. Et comme la plupart des compositeurs, elle, euh, le travail chez elle, le télétravail, comme on dit dans un contexte de Covid, ne le dérange absolument pas. Elle aime beaucoup collaborer avec des réalisateurs et des compositeurs internationaux. Elle a également travaillé sur ce film pendant 15 mois, depuis le début. Contrairement à ce qui s'est passé euh, euh, à ses interventions, euh, pardon, des dernières minutes pour sauver la musique d'autres films. Il y a dans votre musique, dans votre travail, un mélange entre l'électronique et la dimension acoustique humaine. Quelle est dans votre composition quand vous commencez votre travail, vous faites des maquettes, ce qu'on appelle des maquettes, c'est-à-dire les... est-ce que dans cette maquette tout est électronique ou il y a déjà des vrais instruments So, he noticed that in your work, there is a lot of, um, in your music, there's a lot of acoustic, but also you tend to focus on the technological part of this composition. So in your demos, is it all mainly instruments or is that a technological part to it as well? Um, it, it varies from project to project. Um, on more conventional scores, more traditional scores, if I'm working with an orchestra, then because we have Hans Zimmer to blame for this, because 25 years ago, he brought in this concept of mock-ups. And he was the first composer to do this, because, let's be honest, um, filmmakers, and I, as a composer, I do not expect filmmakers to have a musical vision. And I'm not insulting film directors, it's that, Um, it's very difficult to explain to a film director your vision. So you have to demonstrate, you have to show them. They need to hear the music. So the music has to be of as high a quality as possible. And because of technology, I mean, in my studio, I have, with technology, there is a level playing field amongst all composers now. We all have laptops, we all have amazing technology to be able to demonstrate our musical intention. So on those conventional projects, I use samples and I play every single note myself of the trumpets, the violins, the percussion, the woodwinds. But on some projects, and those are the projects that I find the most interesting and intriguing like this film is that I will bring in I will come in on board very very early and I will do I will have semi-experimental recording sessions 
with musicians. So I'm having to commit to um, and come up with a, a musical concept in collaboration with the director. And I will bring in musicians and we uh, on this particular film, it was amazing because I brought in musicians and I was recording music with them. Sometimes I didn't even know what I was recording. I would sit with them and we would just, I would come up with melodies on the spot. And it was very, it's very spontaneous and... I'm responding to the images in a very visceral way. Uh, I'm, I'm responding with my heart, not with my head. And, uh, and then I will present, uh, I will record lots of material. Then I will shape it afterwards uh, in my computer and mix in electronics or my voice or any, anything else. And then I will present those ideas to the director. And then we will go backwards and forwards until we end up with a final score. Does that make sense? <laughs> I have to keep up. <laughs> have to keep up, but it's okay, I can do it. Um, du coup, cela varie d'un projet à un autre. Si elle travaille avec, euh, dans une atmosphère plutôt traditionnelle, comme en travaillant avec un orchestre, euh, elle a mentionné le compositeur euh, Hans Dumas. Euh, sa façon de travailler, c'est comme, euh, par exemple, il ne veut pas insulter le réalisateur, mais il ne sent pas censé avoir une vision complète du film. La musique euh, doit donc être euh, de la meilleure qualité possible, et grâce à la technologie, euh, cela facilite la démonstration de, de samples d'échantillons de plusieurs instruments. Et, euh, le plus intrigant dans ce, ce genre de travail, surtout sur en ce film, c'est d'intervenir dès le début et de créer en collaborant avec le réalisateur et d'enregistrer cette musique spontanément surtout. Les mélodies surgissent sur le vif et reflètent ses véritables intentions des compositeurs. Et du coup, elle enregistre également de nombreux échantillons, s'impose, elle les remodèle et les reforme comme elle l'entend, puis elle fait des, des allers-retours, pas des retours des, des échanges avec le directeur et le réalisateur pour voir si leur vision euh, match. Did you forget Hans Zimmer? I did. I mentioned him. Do not worry about that. I mentioned him. Apologies for Hans Zimmer. Euh, et, et donc sur ce projet, vous étiez donc intervenu en amont. Quelle a été la première, la première inspiration Est-ce que c'était des images que le réalisateur vous envoyait ou au départ c'était uniquement ses mots, son, son, sa parole My turn. On this project, uh, what was the first inspiration to get you to join the crew Was it the images behind the film or was it just the director who managed to convince you through his words? Well, I, uh, how I got this job is I went to a film festival and I saw Jerry Rothwell, the director's last film. It was about um, wine growing called Sour Grapes. It's a fantastic film. Uh, it's about wine, wine growing in the south of France, around here. And I saw this film and I thought, this director is incredible. I loved his work. Um, I met him at the end of the festival, at the end of the screening. We had, there was a Q&A, and I was running to get my train back to London, and I said, I have to speak to this director. So I spoke to him, and I said, let's keep in touch. And then two years later, he called me up, and he said, Nanita, I'm making this film. Would you like to score it? But would you have you ever worked with found sound? with sound effects in your music. And I said, you know that I used to be a sound designer, okay, 20 years ago. So we got talking and for me, this project was a dream because it is the perfect combination of everything, all my skills that I had developed over the last 20 years of sound design, working, uh, working with musicians in a very experimental, collaborative way, and, uh, and manipulating sound and telling a story through music and sound. So, um, so I came on board 
two and a half years ago. And, um, and for me, it was a very, very easy decision, um, you know, just to push the boundaries of technology and storytelling and sound in a very immersive uh, way to, to tell a story. So that, that was my appeal. And of course, the subject matter is incredibly powerful and transformative because it helps us see the world through someone else's eyes and to see the world with a different perspective. So that was a very interesting challenge for me. Euh, elle s'est rendue à un festival du film euh, et elle a vu ce réalisateur. Once again, his name, please, Jerry. Jerry Rothwell. Exactly, that yeah. person. <laughs> et du coup, euh, c'était un film sur la viticulture dans le sud de la France. Elle a bien admiré le travail du réalisateur et du coup, elle a décidé de le rencontrer après la projection. Et ils ont gardé contact et deux ans plus tard, il lui a demandé d'écrire la musique de son nouveau film, ce film. Et il lui a demandé, euh, demandé si elle travaillait dans le domaine du design sonore. Bien sûr, c'est une ingénieure sonore quand même. Ce projet était une combination, combinaison de toute son expérience professionnelle et de la volonté de raconter une histoire à travers la musique et le son. C'est toujours cette combinaison qui revient. Elle a rejoint l'équipe il y a deux ans et demi. Elle a décision de repousser les limites de la technologie dans la musique de film. A été facile, une décision facile à prendre en outre, le thème du film, qui est l'autisme, bien sûr, est particulièrement intéressant. Et c'est ça, principalement, ce qui lui a poussé à accepter ce challenge. Et une chose importante dans ce film, c'est cette voix off, ce récit, finalement, le personnage, entre guillemets, nous raconte euh, ce qu'il ressent. Est-ce que vous aviez, à un moment donné, euh, la voix off à, à écouter pour vous inspirer So the, the, the voice off, let's say, of the film, the character that's talking in the background is the most interesting aspect of the film. Was this what inspired you mainly to join the crew? Was it um, a decisive um, factor? This voice off, is it the main interest of the sound of the film? And Naoki Higashida, the boy yes. and his story. Indeed. Yes, yes. I mean, I the way I approach um, any film is obviously having discussions with the director, but to research. Uh, the most important thing for me is to be authentic and to treat the story with in integrity and to be as true to the story as possible and the characters. So I read quite a few scientific papers on aut autism, um, trying to understand... Uh, what makes the characters tick, what's the heart of the characters. And um, so, for example, with there are several aspects of autism. The, the original book, you probably heard David Mitchell, the author of the book, talking. Yeah. And there are 53 questions about how uh, that Naoki poses. Um, What does it feel like to be autistic? So my job was to translate these different aspects of autism into music. Do you want to say that and then I can carry on? Yeah. Euh, elle a discuté avec le réalisateur pour euh, créer ce concept, mais il est très important déjà de faire un travail de recherche pour rester fidèle à l'histoire, mais aussi aux personnages. Elle a lu euh, des, des articles sur l'autisme afin de pouvoir euh, s'identifier davantage avec le personnage principal. Et euh, comme évoqué dans le film, il y a plusieurs aspects à l'autisme. Et les questions que Naoki, le protagoniste, pose, son travail de compositrice constituait à traduire les différents aspects de l'autisme à travers la musique de ce film. So, for example, um, the way autistic people, this is a generalization, um, the way autistic people perceive the world is they see the detail in objects before they see the whole picture. 
So we can come into this room and I will notice as a neurotypical person, I will come in and I will see a cinema with people and red chairs and a screen. But neuro uh, autistic people, neurodiverse people will come in and they'll see the light at the end of that room. And because they are hypersensitive to with all their senses around them, they will those senses will be overwhelming. Okay, so the way that they will, so one aspect I wanted to bring out in the music is to, they'll see, it's like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that are all separate and they all come together to form a whole picture. And so at the beginning of the film and, and some of the pieces, you see here little fragments of bits of music, like a jigsaw puzzle, and then they slowly come together to form a whole. So that's one way of translating this um, experience of autism into music. Elle veut pas généraliser l'autisme de, de manière générale, mais en général, la façon dont les autistes voient les détails dans les objets avant de voir le, le thème principal. Ils sont hyper sensibles à ce qui les entoure et euh, ce qui ressort euh, de, de leur environnement. En fait. euh, comme par exemple les pièces d'un puzzle qui s'assemblent à la fin pour former une image principale. Et du coup, en tant que compositrice, euh, ces petits fragments de musique euh, dans ce film s'assemblent vers la fin lentement pour traduire l'expérience de l'autisme en musique de film. Plein d'autres questions sont à poser, mais évidemment, vous êtes aussi là pour en poser. Je vous laisse la parole sans plus attendre. N'hésitez pas. Oui, euh, je... Oui. One, two. Okay, so I was saying uh, thank you for your work. It was really, really interesting and nice. Thank you. Um, I was surprised during the movie to discover so many <coughs> I can, uh, work around the voices, human voices, which are you're playing with them. And sometimes they are scattered. Sometimes they are more, more centered in the music. So I was wonder, wondering if on the symbol level you were, you were trying to uh, give... You were trying to give the, I mean, the words that they can't express. Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, the, I mean, one of the reasons for using the human voice is because they can't speak in a in a traditional way. I wanted the the voice and the music to represent the internal voice of the characters. And uh, again, you know, I, I took some of the lines, uh, even on a subconscious level, I took some of the words from the original book and translated it back into Japanese. And then I would uh, sing the words and key phrases, key very important phrases from the book in, uh, in the score. So one of the lines, for example, is we are outside the flow of time. And I translated that into Japanese and then sang that at the end. And uh, uh, another key moment, of course, is, uh, well, at the end of the film, when you see the letterboarding and they piece these words, you can almost hear in their minds how they're piecing it together. The reason I jump, you know, and you hear that on the uh, on the title card. So there are some. We didn't want to overdo it, but there are some very subtle moments that uh, we wanted to get across like that. Autre question, remarque. Musique 
Est-ce que je traduis la réponse ou ça va Bien sûr. <rire> C'est pour ça que je suis là. <rire> Et du coup, euh, l'utilisation de, de cette voix off est ici pour représenter la voix interne du personnage. Elle a pris certains euh, des mots du livre original qui a inspiré le film et les a traduits vers le japonais, la langue d'origine. Elle a chanté ces phrases clés du livre. Une des phrases euh, vers la fin a été traduite et puis c'est elle qui la chante vers la fin. Autre moment clé du film, aussi à la fin, c'est qu'on peut presque entendre le titre s'assembler mais lentement. Ce qui reste, qu reste une référence subtile. Alors, questions, commentaires Qu'est-ce que vous avez ressenti dans ce film Allez, je fais un petit sprint. Parce qu'en plus, c'est filmé, donc c'est pour ça, c'est pour que ça puisse être enregistré. Merci. Um, thank you for your music. It was really beautiful. It was like a, a river, really, the, that flew with the, with the whole of the film. Um, I was wondering, you talked about those experimental recording sessions that you had throughout that sort of enabled you to have live musicians in your mock-ups and also, I guess, to sort of um, develop the concept of the score throughout the collaboration. Um, the question is, did you also have a, a final recording session that was, you know, in a more traditional sense or did you just have a number of sessions that then developed into the, the actual final cues? That's a really good question. Um, over the course of a year, I wrote a lot of music that quite a lot of it did not end up in the film um, because it's, I wrote away from the images. I didn't, I wrote, um, had discussed the concepts with the director and then I just wrote from my imagination and then wrote ideas bringing in musicians um i wanted to use the human voice i wanted to use wind instruments one of the parameters that i set myself was i would not use any synthesizers or any electronics so everything you hear had to be created from the sound effects in the film so the sound designer i worked who i worked very closely with would give me um sound effects Uh, and then I would manipulate them and treat them into pieces and then work with the musicians. So, uh, so yeah, so it wasn't, it was a very untraditional process. Um, but it's something that I use more and more and more in my work. Um, I'm scoring a, a drama series for the BBC at the moment and the team are giving me sound effects and I'm manipulating them and using them uh, within the score and creating music out of it. Thank you. Thanks. Je traduis. Euh, ah. euh, pendant un an, elle a écrit euh, beaucoup de, de, de parties de musique euh, de, pour ce film, dont une grande partie n'a pas été intégrée au final mais elle a composé à partir de, de son imagination au début, sans trop s'appuyer sur le film, forcément au, au départ. Euh, elle ne voulait pas utiliser trop l'aspect électronique. Tout ce que vous entendez est créé à partir des effets sonores du film qu'elle a pris et qu'ils étaient manipulés en de nouveaux morceaux sonores. Une méthode, une méthode bien sûr, qui reste non traditionnelle, mais qu'elle utilise de plus en plus souvent. Euh, la musique a un pouvoir sur le film pour déterminer l'humeur du film. C'est ce qui peut, c'est la magie justement de la collaboration. Il faut qu'un réalisateur puisse bien s'entendre avec la compositrice pour que la compositrice ne transforme pas l'intention de la mise en scène. Et là, il y a le choix dans la musique d'avoir une musique plutôt euh, bienveillante, plutôt qui retransmet une, un certain émerveillement chez le personnage alors qu'elle aurait pu être plutôt angoissante. Mais elle ne transmet pas cette angoisse. C'est la musique qui vient décider que le personnage, il est dans une bulle de féerie, quelque part. So, um, the music and the sound, they both influence the tone of the film. And the director and the composers, they both have to get along to produce a fruitful, eventful project at the end. The choice here for this film transmits a sense of relief and tranquility instead of what's expected to be transmitted of stress and anxiety. 
So what inspired that? Oh, gosh, well, um, <clears throat> what, ins what inspired the anxiety and the stress and the relief and the calm? Um, ultimately, the main spine of the film is Naoki Higashida's story and journey and how to present a different reality to uh, the audience. So, for example, with uh, there is tension, um, and it's very important to have tension and release to take the viewer, to take the audience on an emotional journey over the course of the film. So... As a composer, my job is to tell the story through the music, you know. And in the same way that a director is crafting a film and taking the audience on that narrative journey, the music has to subliminally support that and take you on that journey. Um, so Justina, uh, each character, each person in the film has their own they they have their own personality and something that I wanted to bring out. So Justina, there is she represents the global perception of autism. There's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of uh, people don't understand what she's going through. She's regarded as a witch. So I we use the cello to bring out that tension. When you look at um, the way the Nazis in World War II, pre-World War II, and the, their perception of mental disability or um, their perception of autism, when the boy is running through the forest, um, I'm using the cello again there, and that was created from experimental recording sessions with a cellist, Elizabeth Wicklander, She's, um, she's an amazing cellist who is autistic herself. And I remember this recording session we had where she came to my studio and I was sitting in front of the computer and I played her this scene from the film with the forest scene. And uh, I turned around and looked at her and she was crying. And I said, what's wrong, Elizabeth? And she said, I said, is the music that bad? You know? <laughs> and she said, no, 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 the music is lovely. She said, but I feel deeply what the, what the character is feeling, what is happening in the story. And for me, that connection, it made me see the story and the characters in a different way. And that's why it was important for me to, when I choose my musicians, I choose them very carefully. The violinist in the score is Daniel Pioro, who is Johnny Greenwood's violinist. He played on Phantom Thread and um, There Will Be Blood and these incredible scores. And when I, I, I audition my musicians in the same way that an act, uh, a film director will audition their actors. You have to have the right person with the right tone and feeling that they can bring their creativity to your score. So to answer your question in a very long-winded way, <laughs> I want to bring that uh, a huge variety of variety of emotions, that tension and release and empathy and, and all of that through the... Uh, through the music. One other thing is this, the spine of the film is as um, the difference between the sound design and the music in the film. Of course, it all comes together, but there is a difference. The, the sound design represents the abstract nature of autism. The music has to represent the heart and the emotional side. So there is a piano theme that you hear uh, that's quite emotional. And that piano theme you hear three times in the film when Amrit, the Indian girl, is looking at, when you're looking at her art. And, and there are two other times. And so um, in telling the story, we 
allow ourselves to have some kind of emotion in the music, in the film, to tie things together. It's not just an abstract, cold sound design. You know, th there has to be a meeting of these different elements to create empathy somehow. Euh, le socle principal de ce film, c'est Naoki, qui représente en fait une réalité différente pour le public qui voit l'autisme d'un côté général. Il y a évidemment, bien sûr, ce, ce côté d'anxiété, de, de tension, mais aussi de, de la détente. En fait. Il faut amener le public en voyage à travers la musique de ce film, de la même manière que le réalisateur amène, euh, nous amène dans son voyage narratif. Justina, par exemple, et chaque autre personnage ont leur propre personnalité et, et c'est quelque chose qui doit être mis en valeur. Et il y a beaucoup de stigmatisation autour de, de Justina en tant que personne autiste. Euh, le violoncelle ici a été utilisé pour faire ressortir cette anxiété. Pendant euh, la Seconde Guerre mondiale, par exemple, la perception de, de la maladie mentale en général était différente. Le violoncelliste est, est également autiste, Elizabeth, et, euh, et le travail de co collaboration entre les deux était incroyable. Elle a pleuré lors d'une session à un moment donné et Nanita a pensé que la musique était mauvaise en fait. Mais ce n'était pas le cas bien sûr, c'est juste la façon dont la musique traduit les émotions et l'intention derrière le personnage. Les musiciens finissent par apporter leur propre touche à cette traduction musicale de l'empathie et de l'anxiété en même temps. Car elles peuvent coexister bien sûr. Le design sonore et la musique peuvent se rejoindre. Mais la différence est que le son représente la partie abstraite, pendant que la musique représente le côté émotionnel de l'histoire. Le piano, dans ce film, reflète cela parfaitement. Et les émotions, bien sûr, relient les choses entre, les, entre elles. Je vais rebondir d'ailleurs sur le violoncelle que l'on vient d'évoquer dans ce film, et également faire un petit regard global sur votre filmographie. Est-ce que vous pensez que votre travail est de trouver une identité propre à chaque film. Et à la fois, j'ai l'impression qu'on retrouve toujours un style propre chez vous. Et notamment le violoncelle soliste que l'on retrouve dans Pour Sama. Uh, speaking of the cello, do you think it is necessary to find a personal identity in each of the films that you composed et dans, la même, et dans le même temps, on reconnaît toujours un style propre chez elle, notamment l'utilisation du violoncelle dans Pour Sama. Uh, this um, separate identity, uh, musical identity for each film, is notable in your movie for Sama, especially in the usage of cello in it. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, all, all uh, every film is... You can't take the music from one film and put it on another. And, and what happens when you're scoring a film, quite often a film director will take some music from some Hollywood movie, you know, and, and they will put it on their film and they say, I want something like this. And you, it's, which is why a lot of Hollywood movies all start sounding the same, <laughs> um, a certain genre of film. Um, Every film has a unique identity. Every film director wants a unique score for their film. Um, I mean, with For Sama, For Sama, um, it, I scored that film in three different ways. I spent a year and a half working on that film. And originally, the director wanted a Hollywood-style score, a big, bombastic, epic Hollywood drums and strings and, and so on. And I did that because this is a film about the Syrian revolution. It's an epic story. And then halfway through the edit, the whole narrative, the whole story changed and it became more intimate. It's a story about a mother and a daughter and what it means to be human in extreme circumstances. 
in this case, the war and the, and the revolution. So the music that I wrote no longer worked. And we started stripping things down, um, making it more minimalist. And because it's, a, it's, a, it's an emotion, human story. And then I discovered a violinist, a Syrian violinist who's also a refugee. And he was living in Italy at the time. And he was the key, the musical key for the film because the musician, uh, his style of via, uh, violin playing was very raw and edgy and dirty and gritty. And it's like it was like the crumbling city of Aleppo with all the bombing and the shelling going on. So when we put that to the images, it sudden everything clicked into place and that became the sound of the film in a very subtle way so there's that's how we found the uniqueness of the score for for sama for example um, du coup chaque film est unique à sa manière euh, parfois le réalisateur veut quelque chose euh, un morceau une musique qu'il a entendu dans un autre film et c'est ce qui fait que la plupart des films d'aujourd'hui se rassemblent au niveau musical. Mais la composition de Force à main a duré pour elle un an et demi. Et à l'origine de, de la composition, le réalisateur voulait une ambiance hollywoodienne pour le sang. Et c'est ce qu'elle a fait, parce que c'était ce qui était demandé. Mais la narration a changé, bien sûr. Vu que le film parle de ce que signifie d'être une mère et d'être humain pendant un temps de guerre. La musique ne correspondait donc plus à l'esthétique du film. Elle a donc après découvert un violoniste syrien qui a été la clé musicale du film parce que son style en fait était brut et reflétait parfaitement ce que les images voulaient raconter. Et c'est ainsi ce qui représente l'unicité qui a été trouvée pour le film For Sama. Et donc on, on entend dans, dans les mots de Nainita à quel point elle réfléchit, elle pense euh, à la musique, comment elle peut rentrer en relation avec le film. Et on lui souhaite de beaux projets à l'avenir. On guettera les prochains projets, notamment The Tower actuellement sur Canal+, une série en trois épisodes dont elle a fait la musique, The Tower. Je vous la recommande aussi. Donc voilà, merci Nainita d'avoir partagé votre expérience. Merci, bravo.